Great. Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Mark Hamill. Um, I'm the founder and chairman of the Virtual Advisory Board. Uh, delighted to be here um, on Frank's behalf at the Horasis event, um, beaming all over the world. I've got a, an amazing panel with us this evening where we're going to be tackling supporting the new manufacturing for growth topic. Um, the COVID pandemic has shocked manufacturing companies who had to rapidly redesign their processes to permit social distancing. They have a unique opportunity to digitize and perhaps robotize to become national engines of economic growth. How to transform operating and business models to boost productivity while creating new value for companies, society, and the environment. So a pretty small topic we're going to focus on this evening. Um, we've got three uh, amazing people. Um, we've got Hindu, uh, who's worked his career in global leadership and transforming the financial ecosystem through digital evolution, fintech revolution, and financial inclusion. He's now leading an initiative to impact the majority of the world's population in the rural and farming sector with an initial beginning in India. Welcome, Dr. Sindhu. Thank you. Uh, very happy to welcome uh, Bernard Gilchini. Bernard has led teams in a variety of roles in a variety of industries, but the common theme is moving companies and their people forward on a consistent path to growth and success. Currently, Bernard is the EVP and CEO of Matic Americas, where he brings more than 25 years of global multicultural leadership experience he joined Dematic, a global leader, providing a comprehensive range of intelligent intralogistics and materials handling solutions in 2014 to lead their Southern European division. And our third esteemed speaker today, Bernard, thank you for joining us. Uh, our third speaker this evening is Dr. Ruchi Dana. Dr. Ruchi is a multi-award winning doctor, thought leader, innovator, and entrepreneur. She's a frequent keynote speaker panelist and moderator at a variety of industry conferences and sits on several cor corporate startup and NGO boards. Dr. Ruchi is the president and COO of Duluth Medical Technologies Incorporated, a Silicon Valley based robotic medical device startup focused on development, intelligent, agile and affordable surgical robots. Dr. Ruchi, we're so happy to have you with us this evening uh, today as well. So I think, guys, we'll, we've done um, some very, very, I suppose, maybe just a, a high-level comment, each of you, and then we'll go into the, the questions and answers. We, we'll go in the order of the introduction. So, Dr. Sidio, maybe just a quick comment on uh, how, what you're finding through the pandemic. What's your view on current state of affairs? Uh, how, how, how have things been affected uh, from your point of view at the moment? The only thing I think the most important feeling is that one feels that. Uh, one is free now, finally, and out of bondage. So that's the biggest feeling. And that is spurring so many other activities uh, in which we are trying to involve ourselves once again, which we are missing with, uh, like, uh, fondly missing. And uh, now with a bigger zeal, we are trying to get into it. Of course, I'm a banker, so I, there are a lot of banking uh, uh, things which uh, have been affected and we have... We are going to see so many changes, so we'll discuss it later on as the panel Absolutely. moves further. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Cindy. Bert Bernard, at, at an emotional level, how are you finding coming out of the, the pandemic, or what's the, the, the a, a emotional quotient at the moment? Well, from the emotional <coughs> perspective, I have to say we're happy to see the end of the tunnel, and and, and we see, and as I was saying, uh, moving between the U.S. and Europe, I see I see still some differences in, in the way we're tackling this this issue in different places of the world. Um, Europe is a little bit behind. I'm currently in Europe, so Europe is a little bit behind. But 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 it's it's from the emotional point of view, we had our first face to face meeting with the key members of the team, and and believe it or not, we have been very good in mastering teams and mastering video conferencing and, and working hard, but but the face-to-face -face meeting is completely different and is adding really value to the conversation, is adding value to the communication. Um, I think we, it, it was impressive the way all of us reacted to this this new uh, environment, but, but honestly, yeah. One hour meeting face to face has has no value anymore, right? It's it's, it's very it's <laughs> somebody involved. So I'm gonna pay for having meetings now. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Bernard. Ruchi, how are you finding? You obviously doing uh, some long haul flights, 
But how, how are you finding the uh, emotional aspect of being be back with people again? And... Yeah, so so I've been based in Dubai and I travel quite a lot to the West Coast. So I've been here in Dubai, things are pretty open, so it's it's never really mattered. But like the border between Dubai and Abu Dhabi is still closed, like you need to get a PCR test to go through. So that's oh. creating a lot of hurdles, uh, specifically even, even for the residents who are living here. So that was one of the main hurdles. But apart from that, in terms of like the flights and the tourism, it's all open. And, and things have been moving on very well, especially just after the new year, there was a, a steep increase in the crisis. But now it's under control. And uh, I think during the summer, uh, Dubai gets really, really hot. So people usually try to travel uh, to other places. So Indeed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Dr. Sidilik, we'll just jump straight into the, the first question. Just um, in your opinion, what is the future of banking after the global pandemic? And what is the new reality in the financial services sector? The basic uh, difference that uh, we are going to see is we are moving away from the uh, physical fiat to digital currency. That is one of the biggest achievements that we can see uh, of this fintech revolution, which has been uh, further intensi intensified by uh, pandemic. Uh, then we got very good examples and very good instances of why digital movement should succeed and should take care of substitute the fiat currency uh, like uh, the cause of uh, financial inclusion that was highlighted because people were unable to reach uh, the banking uh, atms and uh, take out money and all so that digital flow of money can only save them and uh, help them that was one of the lessons second was uh, uh, while staying inside and not going outside for fear of uh, catching uh, infections. Everything was home delivered. So now the payment system was the biggest uh, beneficiary of this pandemic because the focus has once again shifted, not only to the payment, but the mode of payment also. Earlier, we were trying to work on the cross-border payment system, the speed of payment system, but now the modality, like uh, without touch, it should be just uh, moving like that. So um, uh, earlier we used to have batch processing of uh, financial transactions. Now we are, have shifted to uh, uh, like RTGS system, real time uh, settlements. So these are fundamental differences which we are seeing in the field of payments. Then, uh, as I told you, financial inclusion is the biggest uh, lesson that we have learned. And we have seen that the majority of the population which was left out of the banking pain, that has to be brought inside. And the concept of uh, financial uh, technology, which we call fintech, espoused by Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency, gained their roots because of the decentralized nature. It has created a... Uh, 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 whirlwind of reform in our financial sector and we are talking of decentralization decentralized apps decentralized finance and the benefit is that now we are not dependent on banks there are decentralized institutions which are taking care of all these financial activities now from there again the uh, another offshoot of uh, this process is that banks are becoming redundant for their structure and their functioning because they are being taken over by other entities. Now, those other entities are not only banking um, entities. They are even companies which are taking over your banking activities. There are even uh, uh, non-bank institutions which are taking over your banking uh, services. And that's where we got the concept of uh, uh, point of service and point of sale, wherein these even um, uh, like uh, corner uh, shops, they could act as a source of deposit and withdrawal of funds. So that widely expanded the reach of money to those people who did not have the access to banks. 
So that is the biggest, biggest benefit that has been coming out. And with this, the focus on MSME, it has been doubled. Now, MSME was languishing because of uh, 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 not proper funding, higher rate of interest. And people were not uh, like paying that much of attention because banks were not paying. That, that was more of elitist nature. So there was no concept of funding for financial inclusion or promotion of MSMEs. So all these sectors which can really cater to the development of the society and ultimately development of the country has been put to focus once again. Yeah. And the banking is getting broken up into different parts and here we come up with the concept of new banks challenger banks disruptive institutions and finally uh, open banks so now what banking is uh, uh, turning out to be a skeleton with multiple apis like applications are getting connected to a central body and they are performing different work so there are multiple entities which are doing it so it is not only the bank which is responsible for all the activities. So the burden is shared. The uh, reach is, uh, has expanded. And ultimately, it is creating uh, changes in the society. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Thank Cindy, you. for that, that ex ex extended answer. I know we'll speak a little bit more about the fintech revolution later on as well and get some more input sure. on that. Uh, Bernard, at, at the heart of the logistics industry, obviously slightly affected. And we're all hugely grateful for what you guys have been able to do and deliver to us. But maybe just a little bit of unique insight from your point of view on the impacts, particularly the logistics space that you, you uh, know incredibly well, uh, how you found it and, and kind of what you're seeing kind of going forward as well. Yeah, it's very different from the fintech. But um, first of all, thank you for, for inviting us as logistics specialists or intra-logistics specialists in a manufacturing conversation, because actually what we saw over the last five, 10 years is, is that, that the warehouse management is becoming really an engine for multiple businesses. And very similar to the way we manage the manufacturing, we have to manage the distribution with the same, the same constraint, the same complexity and so on and so forth. So thank you so much. So we're, 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 uh, we're very much logistic driven and intra logistic driven. Guess what? I mean, the this COVID uh, has had such a positive impact in our industry, um, and and we are one of the very few industry uh, that have been taking advantage. It's not nice to say it, but I have to admit, mm -hmm. taking advantage of the COVID because the COVID has has really uh, created a macro trend that 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 this is the macro trend of the online. That, that has really reshaped completely the logistic industry and, and basically the, the needs for most of the customers to shifting or restructuring the way they they're distribute their products. So there's a huge growth in this industry right now. There's a double-digit growth happening in a business that is very mechanical, electronic, and software. Um, and it's a growth like, like we had in the IT industry in the 90s, right? It's unbelievable. And, and actually... Um, I have to say that 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 this e-commerce trend uh, was accelerated by COVID, right? So you know that in ten year, in ten months, basically we had more growth in the online shopping than we had over the last ten years. It's unbelievable how much the growth has has been developed over the last the last ten ten years, and and we we plan that thirty percent of the uh, retail sales in, in five years from now, 30% will be done online. Uh, it's a huge number compared to where we are today. There are different numbers from, from, from countries. China are much more advanced than, than Europe uh, and and US are also ad more advanced than Europe. But but roughly 30% of the retail sales going online, it's a huge, it's a huge number. Nobody have ever thought that this could happen uh, before the COVID nineteen crisis, nobody that was that was that was that was impossible. Uh, and actually, the interesting thing is that forty three percent of people who bought online during the pandemic did it for the first time. Really? Yeah. That's this incredible. is this is this is an incredible number. So forty three percent of the people, and the reason is very easy, right? Everybody everybody didn't want to go shopping uh, physically because of safety. But there's another thing that happened that most of us were working from home. 
So getting the goods delivered at home was easy because we were there, right? So there were not this dissatisfaction of not getting the products because nobody's at home or so on and so forth. So that has facilitated the growth of this business. We, so, we, got, to, we, got, we got to know personally, Bernard, our UPS guy, our DHL guy, our... <laughs> these guys were coming like every day with something. So you, you go to a whole new level of relationship with these guys. Yeah, exactly. That, that's true. So most of the business have, have had to completely reshifting or rechanging the way they were, they were doing uh, their own distribution, as I said at the beginning. Uh, the most important shift is, is, is basically that, that we're moving now into the necessity for the business to starting to build a real, a real system that is interconnected because the multiple, multiple distribution center. You cannot, like you did in the past, having a central warehouse from where you distribute your products. If you have that, you cannot meet the speed by which you need to, uh, to deliver your product and as well as the accuracy. And, and therefore, you have to go to automation to meet those two important requirements, which is speed and accuracy. Uh, believe it or not, I believe that more than 80% of the people, they expect when they order online to be delivered the next day. This is not very impressive, but 60% of them, listen to this one, this is, this is driving me crazy. 60% of the people shop, shopping online expect to receive their goods within three hours. <laughs> so it, it's, completely, it's completely crazy. So I don't know how we're going to handle this challenge, uh, but our company is here for helping the business to create the challenge. But despite this, the important, the important trend that we see is that we're moving from centralized, I, I like the word centralized, decentralized warehouse to something that is becoming very much decentralized, interconnected, what we call the micro-fulfillment center. What is happening is a lot of grocery business now are taking, are closing their store and use their store as fulfillment center just to be close to their customers. And the automation, the automation technology that we're using is, is really allowing us to, to be able to develop these kind of things up to what we call the uh, lights out distribution center, where basically we can achieve such a level of automation that you don't need lights because everything's run smoothly uh, and everything is automated. So we can, we can, we can send and we can um, uh, distribute all those products. So there is, this industry is becoming more and more sophisticated. You will see more interconnection of distribution center, micro fulfillment center, because the challenge is at every point in time, you need to know where every single product is and you need to be able to change and to shift based on the demand and the supply that is becoming extremely, how do you say, variable. And this is a challenge for the company because the delivery and the accuracy of your delivery is dictating how much the customer is loyal to you. And therefore, that is becoming really, really very, very strategic. And, and that's where we are uh, developing with many businesses solutions that, that, that is helping to achieve that very crazy objective. And I will, I will close with one comment because I'm coming from the IT industry, from the uh, California Valley world, right? And I do remember that 20 years ago, we had exactly the same problem. And, and, and that will help you understand where this industry is going. When I started in the IT industry, we have this famous mainframe and we have monitors mm -hmm. from which we go and get the information from the, uh, from the mainframe. And now we are in the area of the internet and we move through multiple areas like the client server architecture. We move to the network architecture uh, to finally reach the, uh, the internet and, and the cloud, right? But I believe this industry is going exactly in the same thing. We are right now at the stage of the centralized warehouse where people are coming and picking up goods. And now we're moving to the world where we need to have small warehouses, small warehouses maybe with a server in the middle, uh, servicing multiple network uh, warehouses that need to be interconnected and, and you need a lot of software to make sure that, that actually you can manage all those warehouses, you can interconnect all those warehouses together and that you create basically an agile system uh, and you are able to change based on, on how your, your demand is looking like. This is fascinating industry and this fascinating challenge that we're having. And, and COVID has accelerated all this basically uh, at a speed of sound.
Thank you so much, Bernard. And just Bernard, before going to Dr. Ruchi for a second, what, what was that pressure point like, Bernard, back in you know, March, April last year when everything was being locked down? What was that like in your in the intra logistics space? I mean, the pressure must have been incredible. That that lift off must have been incredible to like lift. I mean, yeah, did, abs ab absolutely, well, completely right. But but I will tell you personally, the most the most complicated things was the pressure that we received from the customer to go on site despite the COVID and continue to build their infrastructure and their distribution center. So it was more a pressure from the people and safety management point of view than from the business point of view. So yeah. we went through a couple of months of very strong and difficult decisions because we had to protect our people. That was that was that was something that was all of us as leaders were were completely obsessed about because the customer and, and, and I'm talking about big names, right? They wanted in that in that period to have people going on site and building their infrastructure and accelerated uh, what we call compression, right? Compression, the time to deliver the infrastructure, and we had to send people on site despite the uh, the COVID. And and I have to say that both thematic and customers, we have done tremendous things to protect all our employees and all our people, so they could go there and work safely uh, despite the uh, the um, how to say despite the condition. I believe that was was my real stress more than the uh, than the peak in demand. <laughs> Thanks, Bernard. Dr. Tucci, I'm so excited to get to chat to you as well. You've got amazing perspective globally, particularly what's going on in the US as well, from a healthcare and investment, an NGO, a robotics point of view. I mean, maybe just if you can download a little bit on what you're seeing, what you're observing, um, it would be so grateful to hear your, your thoughts. Sure. Thank you so much, Mark, for inviting me. So I think robotics has performed really well. So initially when, when COVID-19 had hit, like all the elective surgeries were closed down. So like there was a place in time where like robotics was a little bit low, but then there, there were innovative forms of robotic solutions for healthcare, like robots out there to serve as nurses, to go to the COVID-19 patients and give them medicines, robots with an iPad sort of thing in which like the doctor could have like a telehealth sort of thing in the COVID-19 wards. And then there were like robots in Dubai, which were like, uh, doing a disinfectant uh, drive all across the hospital corridors. And also I think like, Robotics was maybe not used inside the surgery rooms because it uh, like robotics mainly used for elective procedures, but robotics was definitely used a lot within the hospital infrastructure. So that was one of the good things. And now that elective surgeries are back again, there's a huge adoption for robotic surgery because robo robotic surgery definitely reduces the manpower that's required in the hospital. So you, you and there are less chances of infection. And you can free up a lot of resources for COVID-19 patients because like robotics actually makes uh, surgeries into daycare surgeries instead of having like three to five days of hospital stays. The surgery are minimally invasive and can be like done in, in a day itself. The patient can be discharged the same day. So I think in that way, robotic surgery has picked up really well. And apart from that, we also saw a lot of trends like, uh, for example, telehealth uh, really shoot shot off the roof. And then but now we're seeing that telehealth uh, is going a little bit down. And the reason for that is not not patients, because patients really love telehealth a lot of because like instead of like taking a day off uh, work and going and visiting the hospital, patients really loved like the, the entire approach of telehealth because there was also like this entire uh, scary mindset of like if you go to the hospital, you might contract some disease. No, maybe not COVID nineteen, but many other hospital yeah. acquired infections. So there was a general awareness in terms of like preventive medicine and all. In fact, I was on a panel recently with all doctors and the doctors were saying that suddenly there's so much more adoption for the medications that we give. Like the patients, they usually like the patients, they don't continue the medications and all. But these days, everybody's so strict and so serious about the kind of like uh, precautions that doctor advise or the medications that doctors give. So I think like in terms of chronic diseases, again, it has been a good move because uh, people who had chronic diseases or had like comorbidities, they are definitely taking a lot of more care about themselves. One of the reasons that telehealth has come down is uh, there's, a, there's a challenge within the healthcare infrastructure. So if you look at like hospital chains and all, oftentimes they have like their own pharmacies, their own labs, they, they have a cafeteria back there. 
So hospitals themselves don't want to promote telehealth because a moment a, a patient would enter a hospital, you can get his uh, like labs reports done within the hospital infrastructure. You can uh, have him like buy medicine from the pharmacy that the hospital is on, and then the patient would definitely get a coffee or something from the cafeteria. So the entire uh, stakeholder uh, chain that was involved in hospital chains has not helped in telehealth. So that's the reason that hospitals are not really promoting telehealth anymore because uh, the regulations have been so that people are like people can visit hospitals again but I, I from my personal experience i realized like the patients really love telehealth module but it's just like uh, there has to be like some sort of incentive for the hospitals again to like uh, go and adopt this entire module apart from that we also saw a lot of uh, new uh, innovations especially with the help of ai and one of them was in drug discovery and drug repurposing so there's like, uh, the, again, there's a lot of robotics involved in that because you have like high throughput screenings and like you can uh, actually come up with uh, precision medicine and personalized medicine. And uh, like even in terms of like the genome mapping, the cost of uh, genetic screening has come down so much. And I think like the, it says in the future, it might come down to $100. So I think that would be a game changer for the entire society. If you are able to map the human genome for just $100, I think that's a game changer. And then like, if you talk about the new trends, we would definitely see a lot of personalized medicine, precision medicine, because eventually like if you if the genome is mapped out, then you can work out and uh, sort of reverse engineer what sort of medicine could work out for these patients. So I think these are the key trends that we saw. But apart from that, there's, there's a huge amount of things that are going on in advanced therapies, gene therapies, cell therapies. Also, a lot of things that are happening in, in terms of computational biology. So I think like these are some sectors that have picked up a lot of momentum because of COVID-19. And other than that, even the patients are much, much more uh, like they they try to take the medications regularly. They are much, much more aware of their health. So overall, like preventive healthcare has gone up really. Dr. Ruchi, from a from a um, uh, innovation point of view, which markets are you seeing? Are there any surprising markets or innovation hubs that you're seeing? Oh, these guys are doing it incredibly well. Or but where are you finding the pockets of innovation globally at the moment? So personally, I've seen like in terms of uh, like uh, genetics and microbiome, there has been a huge adoption in the in the Western part of the world. But suddenly the Eastern part of the world has sort of risen up and trying to map their genome. So like initially, if you would have gotten like a 23andMe test done for, uh, let's say, any any person from India, the only sort of information you'd get is that you, you come from an Indian heritage, but you don't really get much more data out of it because there's not much data out there for the Southeast Asian or the South Asian population. But I think that is changing in a huge way. So I think, and apart from that, there has been a lot of focus on microbiome as well, which is like the gut health. So, and, and a combination of uh, genetics, microbiome, and then a number of other data points along with that, I think a number of clinical research organizations are working on, on such models in which like the more data points you collect, you're, you're able to get a comprehensive picture of, of a person and then come up with like new solutions for various rare diseases and all. That's incredible. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think that. Sorry. Yeah, Dr. Sidney, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was saying that even the concept of digital twins that has greatly uh, revolutionized the whole uh, medical world because you are doing all the research within your lab. You don't need any external support, and it is like uh, all the effects of uh, all your uh, research can be mapped there. With the digital yeah. twins, yeah, that's true. Fantastic, Dr. So, Sidney. I was going to ask on the digital evolution, the fintech revolution, financial inclusion in the post-COVID era. Let me just your, your thoughts on how the, the the financial world is going to evolve. What, what you're seeing or predicting, um, be, being so at the cutting edge of it yourself. Like uh, these are all very big terms and uh, subtle terms, but you have, you have I, having per... a vast meaning. <laughs> meaning. <laughs> so, so I will start with a revolution. So a revolution has a very strict uh, format. It moves from say point A to point B. It totally overthrows the old thing and starts a new one. So that is a revolution, but we have not seen such a revolution in our financial world. So for that matter, uh, I will uh, 
use this term very, very selectively and rarely because that will be an offense to a financial committee and bankers like us. <laughs> that is one part. Now we come to the second part. What we see that there has been uh, evolve, e e e evolving of the technology in due course. So that is why I will go ahead with this concept of digital evolution. So now in evolution, what happens? It moves, of course, from one point to another point again, but in a winding manner in which it is also uh, reinventing itself. It is also creating its uh, variant. So there are new models which come up also uh, within that movement. So it is not just one uh, uh, object moving from point A to point B. That object itself gets uh, changed in its format and nature and scope while moving from point one to uh, point A to point B. And there are so many uh, tentacles to that uh, evolutionary pattern also. So it keeps on affecting so many parts of the society or uh, whatever uh, constituency we are talking of. So in this case, when we talk of uh, digital evolution, we are seeing that digital evolution is hitting all the segments of society. And especially when it is hitting the financial sector, we are terming it financial transformation, financial technology, financial uh, uh, technical revolution. Also, we talk of because it is totally trying to get rid of the heritage system and the legacy system and create a new a pattern and a new temperament uh, of working and uh, banking is set up. Now, in that, there are structural changes. Like uh, earlier also, I said, uh, uh, we are uh, moving towards open banking, neo banking, challenger banks. So the legacy system is getting fully jolted. Then there are functional uh, variants, functional changes which have uh, come out of this evolutionary uh, uh, scheme of the technology. Now, in that, what we are seeing that the role which was being played by a bank is now being played by multiple agencies. So it is not only the uh, dictate of the bank which will uh, run the uh, rule the roost. Uh, uh, there are multiple agencies trying to benefit the society trying to lower the uh, cost factor of the transaction. So it is creating a total social movement in the society as well. And with this uh, pandemic thing, the most important segment which has been affected has been migrant labor. Because of their movement from one place to another and with no banking support, that was the biggest hit uh, of the uh, pandemic. And uh, we have our own neo bank system in India, and uh, we have uh, our uh, this uh, direct money transfer system in that. And we have we're catering, and you won't believe we have grossed the highest uh, um, uh, say uh, 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 turnover turnover uh, within this year 2021. It is nearly 300 million US dollar equivalent. When there was uh, such a pandemic and everything was at stop, reason was there was no banking. So people were dependent on these fringe actors and players who were providing all these banking services. So that has been the biggest uh, structural and functional change in the banking sector. And that is the result of evolution. It is not a revolution because we had the uh, like... Uh, 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 top banks like central bank, then we had all these big banks, then we had cooperative banks, rural banks, like that in developing countries and all that, then financial unions. Uh, so these are gaining importance now and the micro units are getting more importance than the bigger ones. Earlier, no one cared for that. But now that segment is uh, saturated. So looking for more market because in uh, uh, fintech, your data is supreme. So you need more customers to have more data. So when you want to expand your customer base, you have to move to new areas. So these are the frontiers which have to be conquered now. 
that is why they are using technology to go to these areas secondly fintech is such a thing that you cannot just assign it to banking only fintech is embedded in all possible activities be it a reg tech be it prop tech be it health tech be it insure tech everywhere you have the payment system so wherever payment system is there banking is there and finance is there so that part uh, remains there now it also uh, the, with the pandemic the working scenario in all the uh, say factories offices everything changed work from home became the concept if you are working in office like alternate days every 3 days that also created there also they had a hybrid model that okay should you meet a customer or you should not meet you should sit in your chamber and just keep on working so work from home hybrid style of working all those things came up in office working then the focus on uh, digitizing and robotizing your industry which was always on the back burner of the de uh, developing economy suddenly came to the forefront all the ctos they became the most important people because they have to guide this uh, fintech evolution so they have to be now honest to the industry and try to bring everything to a completion as soon as pandemic is over so that they can have a new working atmosphere so this is the biggest impact of uh, 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 this uh, pandemic on uh, these industries that whatever things they were putting on the back burner now suddenly it has come to the fore and they are trying they are racing to complete it then of course the discipline has changed personnel has changed then uh, the second variant will be uh, there is acceleration in digital finance function so there is more emphasis put on digital activities now in that i will take you to the concept of uh, um, uh, central bank digital currencies and digital uh, fiat currencies so practically every country is now working on creation of digital currency and uh, central bank digital currency now these are two different things it may be uh, because nothing is final as such. of course we have seen bahamas uh, coming out with their sand dollars uh, we have uh, uh, um, uh, this china working with digital currency e yuan so there are lot of formats which are coming up but again everyone is trying to create the format on the structure and nature of the country where there are more democratic model of society there the focus on creation of digital uh, finance is taking a different shape it is more decentralized in nature but where the political uh, class of the society is a political class of the governance is not that open and it is not that democratic they have a closed model and a more centralized model so that is why even cbdcs they are fluctuating between these two ends whether they are going to be centralized decentralized so that is uh, one uh, problem whether they are going to be wholesale or retail because if they go ahead with wholesale they are going to control all the privacy of people because they will have all the data at their disposal if they go ahead uh, with their uh, say retail model then okay banks will be there but if central bank is doing the retail model then all the banks are going to melt away because that, that is the intermediary tier and if central bank takes over the work of different commercial banks then there is no need of any banking but if we think in concept of say open bank wherein different institutions are working through api integration and performing the different tasks of a bank and central bank is taking over the retail functions of a bank then there is a totally different scenario and we are talking of decentralized society decentralized economy decentralized what not but actually we are moving towards more centralized system with a digital uh, intrusion because yeah. everything the whole data will be controlled by the government
and since we have a political economy we cannot think that the economy will be moving uh, away from the politics and the political leader will not care the politics is guiding the economy so the uh, say the class war the currency war so, uh, uh, fight for supremacy country supremacy uh, nationalism uh, supremacy currency supremacy these are not going to go away so we are gradually moving towards centralized decentralization to make people satisfied that yes there is some sort of decentralization but yeah but yeah. <laughs> more you control the data more you are centralized so that is how we are <laughs> moving and doing it and of course uh, with digitization you have more of uh, cloud uh, based services so it is uh, going to provide more secrecy but when we talk of digital economy and uh, like uh, you must have read about uh, el salvador shifting to bitcoin as the uh, um, uh, um, legal tender and the main uh, currency of the um, um, country now you just think of the uh, situation mr musk makes a tweet and bitcoin fluctuates like anything the pendulum swings left to right right to left so the country will suffer due to one person here we are trying to criticize the government or the bank that they are cheating us they are uh, ripping us they are taking all the advantages from us but here there is just one person who is going to play with the entire country's economy so are we going to accept that sort of model or being social animal we will still try to have some sort of social regulation some uh, semblance of control over the herd community and be social and responsible animals this is what we need to decide so uh, thanks how to socialize the data is the most I, important digitize I'm happy my pay i just i'm just happy my paypal account works get about the so you know that paypal paypal got me through a lot of online purchases through the pandemic yeah, yeah. <laughs> very very great so thank you for that insight bernard i saw um dematic recently won a very prestigious uh, award and maybe you tell us a little bit about that and a little bit on the, the kind of future the impact of obviously ai on the intro logistics space and your 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 thoughts uh, ahead yeah uh, again listening to to the fintech and the uh, this new technology where we're we're probably not a bar here with with what happening in other industry but but yes you're right we received a very nice award from the uh, the, the the manager magazine and and bain on on basically what we call the game changer um and that award went to to kion kion is our mother company uh simply because we we we're contributing um uh, to this revolution um i like what what you said before we're not really in the revolution world we we're really in a in accelerating evolution uh in our logistics and 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 basically we've been rewarded because we we deliver a sophisticated solution complex solution uh, using new technologies um uh, the internet of the things the uh, the cloud technology of course the uh, big data and and artificial intelligence uh because of what we were saying before everything has to be connected everything has to be predictable in terms of 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 demands and so on and so forth for optimizing for optimizing the way we are we're using our technology uh in, in order to minimize the cost to minimize the impact on the uh, on um on the environment and so on and so forth so the fact that we are the forefront of of developing solution with with new sophisticated technology has has led the uh, uh, magazine manager and bain to to award that uh, that uh, that um, yeah to uh, to award to kion uh, that game changer uh, award for uh, for our industry and 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 it's very very interesting and very nice and and especially i love what i say every cto now is becoming important in the fintech i believe that in most of the company every supply chain uh, uh, senior vp is becoming the most important person of the company so i'm predicting yeah. that in the next 5 years or in 5 years from now most of the ceo